This Panzer II is not the model I'll be making in this video. But the only reason this video exists is because of this model. I made this about six years ago, and the results were so much worse than what I expected and what I wanted that I gave up modeling entirely. This was only the third model I'd ever made. And honestly, I haven't looked at it since I put it in a box and hid it in a closet. It's really not that bad. If I had just kept at it, I would have learned so much and improved so much in those six years that I would be light years ahead of where I'm starting at right now. This series is following me trying to get back into modeling with an open mind and being accepting of my failures. I'm not starting from square one. In the past month, I've built and painted about four models, and I've decided that I really want to get back into it. I hope you enjoy the video, and if you have any advice that would help me or anyone else trying to get started in this hobby, please be sure to leave a comment below. On a previous model, I learned just how important washing before priming is. It's a step I was skipping, and uh, it kind of came back to bite me. So I had some issues with the primer actually sticking to the plastic. Washing the model helps to ensure that all the grease and oils from your fingers are removed so that that primer can stick. I'm just washing with Dawn and warm water and a toothbrush to get to the hard to reach areas. And then I'm using the airbrush to try to blow those water droplets out of all the cracks and crevices. Now that the model's all cleaned up, I can start priming. I've been using this Vallejo black primer. It's all they had at my local hobby shop, but it's been working pretty well. Gotta make sure you spill some just for good luck. And then once you get that cleaned up, you can start priming. Uh, I start somewhere that isn't super visible to get the airbrush dialed in. I did the bottom of the hole first and then I moved on to the turret. You wanna make sure your model's dry oh, no. before you start priming. You can see uh, it took me a couple seconds to notice. And then when I did, I set it down and started over. Doing the upper section of the hole here, wanna make sure you get in all those little tight cracks and crevices to make sure that that paint's gonna stick. And this is what it looks like when priming's complete. Just gotta let it dry for a few hours and we can move on to the next step. I'm gonna use this Tamiya White and do kind of like a pre-highlight. It's kind of the opposite of pre-shading. I see a lot of people do a gray primer and then take black and do all the shadows. I'm doing the inverse because I have a black primer, so I'm gonna use white and pick out the highlights. My airbrush was sputtering pretty bad. I had a 0.02 mil needle. Uh, I took the whole airbrush apart, cleaned it out, remixed the paint, and it started spraying a little bit better. I think the needle was bent. I do end up changing it later out for the 0.03, and that's probably what I'm gonna stick with. You get a lot better coverage, uh, and the flow is a lot smoother from what I've noticed. I've been mixing these Tamiya paints one-to-one -one with X20A thinner uh, pretty much every time I spray or brush paint them, and I've been getting pretty good results. This is what the model looks like with those highlights done. This gives me a really nice layer to put the base coat onto so that it doesn't all look like one flat color. It gives a little bit of modulation, and the high points look a little bit brighter with the shadowed areas looking a little bit darker. For the base coat, this is a mix of olive green and buff. It's about eight to one. I found it's best to start off with the airbrush off the model, keep it moving, and be conservative with how much paint you're putting down. You don't want to cover up all that pre-highlighting or pre-shading that you just did. Forgot to pull this track section off. Got to make sure we paint under that. I'm keeping it separate for now so that I can paint it with the rest of the tracks to try to get a consistent look. Here we are moving on to the top of the turret. This is one of the reasons I mixed in a little bit of buff, and a little bit really does go a long way. It's a very bright 
color. I found it's a lot easier to start with a lighter base coat on top of that pre-highlight. And then if you need more shadows, you can mix darker paints. The weathering effects, the gloss coat, the matte coat, all that stuff will darken your paint up too. And if you start with something that's too dark, by the end it's gonna look even darker. I accidentally left the tracks on here. Didn't really notice I got a little bit of overspray on them. Um, so I go back and clean that up with more primer later. Now for the road wheels, I'm using a new technique to do the rubber that I haven't done before. And I think it turned out pretty good. I take uh, the gray and black, mix it about one to one, but I don't mix it all the way. And I essentially do a wet blend on the wheel as I'm painting. I think if you do a solid color on the rubber, like a solid black, it looks really dark and it looks just kind of fake. So I think having a little bit of variation in the color kind of helps it look a little bit more realistic. I'm mixing on a wet palette that I made for a few cents. It's just an aluminum food tray, some paper towel and parchment paper. And what that does is it keeps the paint from drying out too quickly. Before I was using that, I just did it on paper and you could only work with the paint for a few minutes before it would totally dry out. Make sure you don't forget to paint the outside rim of the road wheels either, the part that's like actually gonna be seen from the side. This is what they look like when they're done. You can kind of see some of that color variation there. And here's the rest of the model with that base coat. After I do the base coat, I like to move on to the details. I think this is where things really start coming together. For these windows or periscopes, I'm starting with a layer of gloss black, and then I'll do very thin light coats of uh, metallics over that to try to emulate that reflective look that you get from glass. Now for the wood, I'm doing a mix of buff and dark yellow. I kind of am doing the same wet blending thing where it's not totally mixed. You want to do this in thin layers, almost like a wash, and slowly build it up. Uh, here, I think I did it a little bit too thick. But in my next video, I got really, really good results. Look much more realistic than this, so I'm pretty excited to show that. But this is how it turned up this time, and that's okay. I'm pretty happy with how this looks. Here's the head of that sledgehammer. I'm doing that same mix of engine gray and NATO black, but with more black this time. I'm just using this as a base coat, and then I'll do a little bit of dry brushing of metallics over that. Now for the tanker bar in the back, it's the same mix of NATO black and engine gray. When it comes to doing details like these, it just takes patience and precision. You don't want to work too quickly. You want to make sure your paints are properly thinned so that they flow and you don't get brush marks. You can use magnifying glasses like the jewelers use. Sometimes I'll use them for the really small details. Um, but I'm starting to move away from that because I think it's better to be able to just look at the model and build that hand-eye coordination. Now I'm doing a metallic paint on this 50 cal. In real life, guns are not bright gunmetal metallic. And by the end of this model, that's not what this gun's gonna look like. So yeah, it looks a little goofy now, but when we get to the weathering stage and start doing oil washes, it'll really tone down these metallics and give that kind of parkerized finish that the M2 has.
And then of course you got to make sure to paint the mount and the ammo can for the 50 cal. I'm just using the straight olive green. I want it to be a little bit different than the base coat and a little bit darker. These tweezers I'm using are just called self-closing tweezers. They came in like a pack of four, a variety pack of tweezers that I bought. Super, super useful. You just essentially clamp the part in there and then you don't have to worry about holding it and making sure that you're maintaining pressure. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to paint these small detail parts. And if you get it in a pack of other tweezers, it's like five bucks for four tweezers. So it's really inexpensive. Here I'm painting the ammo can. I'm just doing olive green thinned out a little bit with that X20A thinner. If anyone has a good idea of what X20A actually is and a like cheaper alternative, please leave a comment because that stuff's pretty expensive. And if it's just like watered down IPA, it'd be nice not to have to spend the money. Now here I'm doing highlights. So I've mixed that olive drab and buff mixture, but instead of doing eight to one, I'm doing something close to like six to one, just a little bit lighter. And I'm hitting the high points to really accentuate the highlights. With these highlights, I'm mostly sticking to the center of panels and the edges. And then I'm going to darken those shadows. I'm doing the mix of olive drab and brown. I try to avoid using black when I'm doing the shadows because I think it takes a lot of the saturation out of the color. Um, so I mix the olive drab with brown instead to try to keep that green color, but make it just a little bit darker. Here I'm doing the underside of the gun tube and the underside of the turret because logically those places would be in shadow. They're going to be the darkest places on the turret because they don't have any exposure to overhead light. Next I'm moving on to the tracks here. I'm going to start with engine gray and just base coat the whole thing. I don't really like these rubber tracks. I prefer the individual track pieces. I feel like you get a lot more detail out of them. I want to make sure that you get this little track segment that's going to go on the hole too. And then let me just <coughs> spill some paint real quick and then get ready to spatter on the rust colors. I'm doing orange mixed with a red brown. I just thin it out with water and a little bit of dish soap. And I'm going from a bright orange and then a brownish red. And then the final color will be a darker brown. All of these raised sections are track pads and they're made of rubber. So I'm using the same mix of NATO black and engine gray. And then doing that sort of wet blend thing on the model as I'm painting it. This step is a little bit tedious, but you can get through it pretty quickly, and the end results I think look really good. This is my first time doing rusted tracks, uh, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. I think some of the splotches were a little too big, so I might try using a toothbrush and flicking paint off of that next time. Um, to get smaller little rust spots and get a little bit more detail out of it. But this is what the tracks look like complete. Uh, and I think everything's coming along pretty nicely here. We're going to be doing decals next, so I'm going to put a gloss coat down. This is my first time doing a gloss coat before decals. I had really bad silver skinning on my last couple models. Uh, and that's when you get this kind of gray outline around the decals. I couldn't find future floor finish, which is what all the forms recommend. 
but I did find this acrylic based floor finish and here I am testing it out and it worked fine. Uh, this is a very thin mix and I was spraying at my normal 18 to 20 PSI. Once I realized just how much of that floor finish was actually coming out of the airbrush, I turned it way down, maybe to like five or seven PSI. You kind of just get a feel for it. You want to lay it on pretty heavy. It has some self-leveling stuff in it. Um, so you put it on in thick coats. It looks a little bit milky and it's really stressful until it dries. And then it has this nice gloss coat that's perfect for putting decals on. You can see here just how thick I put that on. I probably could have gone a little bit thicker, a little bit heavier with the coats um, to help that self-leveling stuff that's in it work. I also should have dusted the model off before I did this clear coat. Every time that you take a break from painting, when you come back, you should dust everything off. Uh, just use your airbrush and microfiber towels you don't want to trap dust under the paint, which I definitely did in some areas on this. Now for the decals, originally I just used water um, and then I read a tip that Microsol and Microset are essentially just vinegar. So I tried it, it seemed to work well. It's just a 50-50 mix. Um, these Tamiya decals are like really thick and they take a really long time in the water. So I'll dip them in for like a minute and then dry them off. And if it doesn't slide off the paper, I'll stick them in for another minute. Here you can't even see that I'm putting the decal on. But once I do get it off the water slide paper, I try to make sure it's all lined up, dry off the excess water without messing the decal up. I have a tendency to mess with things a little too much and that was a close call there, but it went on fine. This one goes on a lot smoother and you get a better view of it. I'm trying to make sure that all of the water underneath the decal gets pushed out so that it lays flat. This one didn't soak for long enough so I dipped it again and then off the model I tried to move it a little bit and now it's coming off the paper just fine. And this front one just went perfect. So this gloss coat is definitely something I'm gonna be doing again in the future. Anytime I need to put decals down, this floor finish seems to work great. It gives a nice glossy finish. It's a very clear coat. It, it doesn't seem to cause any yellowing. It doesn't really change the colors that much. But with the gloss, you can see those highlights and shaded areas, they stick out a lot more. It almost looks cartoonish, but that'll get toned down with the matte coat towards the end. This is also my first time chipping, so I'm doing some sponge chipping. Uh, I just picked engine gray again. I looked at some reference photos and all the chips that I could find on the M41 looked to be like a gray color, just exposed metal. I used an artist sponge for this not like a normal house sponge. I think next time if I do sponge chipping, I'm gonna try using a piece of foam or a piece of like a regular household sponge. The artist sponge had a lot of like jagged edges and it was really uneven, which gave nice variation, but it was hard to control. And I got a lot of bigger splotches in areas that I didn't necessarily want them. Chipping with a brush definitely gives you a lot more control over where those chips are going to be and what they're going to look like. But as someone with very little experience in this, I think using the sponge technique is good because it kind of gives you an idea of what it should look like. 
Now I'm doing the inside of those chips with black, providing a little bit of contrast. I'm mostly picking out the biggest chips and some of the smaller ones, but I'm making sure to leave some of them just gray. So there's nice variation over the whole model. I really enjoyed this part. Doing the chips was really fun and filling in the inside of the chips kind of gave me an idea on how to just do it with a brush instead of having to use a sponge. So you'll see later, I just use the brush and it seems to work out pretty well. I had a hard time finding good reference photos of where these tanks in particular were getting beat up and chipped. So I just assumed that this back section and anything that's protruding or any sort of edge would be pretty chipped up. This is another new product I've never used. This is uh, an enamel wash. My last couple models I did an oil wash and I didn't really like how it turned out. The oils were hard to work with. I think that with more time and experience, it's definitely something that I could master. But these enamel washes went down super easy. They wicked into all the corners and all around the rivets. And then using the enamel thinner, they cleaned up super easy. So I had a really easy time dialing in the effect. I was looking for some sort of brown colored enamel wash, but there wasn't anything in store. So I went with this. This was the lightest dark colored wash that they had. And I think it might have been a little bit too dark for this olive drab color. It ended up looking a little bit cartoonish, but I think it still looks pretty good in the end. This enamel wash just comes up so easy. And I think that now that I know what the consistency of the wash is supposed to be when it comes out of a bottle. When I try oil washing again, it's gonna be easier. I'm just gonna have to understand the differences in how oil works versus enamels. I try to make sure to clean up all the raised surfaces and leave that wash in the edges and the recesses. Here you can see how easily that enamel wicks into all those little nooks and crannies it really helps to create differentiations on the surface between the armor panels and things like these little handles. And it overall makes for a more visually interesting model. Here I'm getting that wash in all those pin lines, those weld beads between armor panels. I'm going pretty heavy with it, but that's the great thing with these enamels is that you let them dry for a little bit and then take a paintbrush with a little bit of enamel thinner on it and it just soaks them right up. So it makes it really easy to dial in the effect. You can definitely make your own washes, but what I've seen as a beginner is that buying the pre-made stuff makes it a lot easier because you don't have to worry about getting the right mixture and the right proportions and you get a pretty good looking effect with a lot less effort. Here I am using oil paints to make a wash. I'm just mixing it with some odorless thinner and I'll be using it on this metallic 50 cal to try to tone down the paint a little bit. In real life, these guns aren't shiny at all. They have kind of a parkerized finish. These oils take a really long time to dry, but at the end, I think it gives a pretty good effect. And here's what the model looks like with the pin wash done. Now, one of the issues I had with this kit is that there was no clear sprue for the windows. I used this Bondic UV resin to create the windows, and I just slowly built it up layer by layer. I used this on one other model uh, that didn't have lenses for the taillights. It turned out really good but I think that's because it was a flat surface. On this, I'm trying to like fill a gap. So I had to build it up in layers and then it didn't really look flat like you'd expect from a glass periscope. I think it's better than not having anything there, but I would have preferred 
if this model had come with a clear sprue. Here you can see me trying to fill in all those gaps. And at the end, I think it, you know, it's a pretty convincing result. Now I'm doing the uh, brake lights and the little marker lights on the back. Here, because I'm using so little paint, I didn't bother with the wet palette. And I just use a slightly dark mix of red and then a slightly off-white mix for the little white markers. These little, little details are always, I think, really fun. It really starts to tie the whole thing together. I'm really looking forward to building up my skills so that I can just keep adding more and more detail to future models. Here I'm doing some more chipping, uh, just based on reference photos. It seemed like this upper slope had a little bit of chipping on it. Seems like it'd be a high traffic area. That's where your driver would be hopping in and out. I'm painting on some chips onto the decal too, so that it doesn't just look like a sticker that's been placed on the armor. Here I'm doing the same thing I did as before, just using some of this NATO black to fill in the center of the chips, give them a little bit more contrast, a little bit of pop. I'm trying to keep most of the chips along edges, uh, hard edges that would be bumping into things and getting scratched up. And then I'm doing some chips in the center of armor panels just to break up the surface a little bit. And now with everything else completed, I'm going to seal it up with a flat clear. This will kind of take away that cartoony effect that the gloss gave. I like the way the flat clear looks, but I did buy some satin gloss, and that's what I'll be using on my next model. Going to see how it works. I think that the matte takes away some of the contrast between the shadows and the highlights in the base coat but it still helps to tie everything together. Overall, at this stage, I'm super happy with the way it turned out. I think it looks great. I've definitely made improvements from my last couple builds, and I've learned some new techniques that I'll be able to improve and apply in the future. Now I'm using a pretty heavily diluted coat of buff, just on some of the raised areas, the edges, just to emulate dust. I think it's another thing that helps kind of tie the lower half of the hole and the upper half of the hole and the turret. I want to be careful here not to cover up all those chips I did, but I can also use this to cover up some of the more over-the-top ones and to tone down some of the effects. This is the mud mixture I've been using. It's just regular school glue dirt from outside, and then some different brown paints. I thin it out with some water, make sure it's the right consistency, and then I'll just slap it on everywhere that mud would get. For the tracks, I make sure to really get it in the recesses, but I cover the entirety of the tracks, and then I wipe off all the raised surfaces, like the track pads, uh, with a paper towel with a little bit of water on it, because realistically, the mud is gonna stay in all those little cracks, but it's not gonna stay on the track pads because that's what the vehicle is driving on. Fenders also get a lot of mud built up in them. And then, you know, there's gonna be some mud kicked up onto the sides. And then here I have a mix of paint, water, and dish soap. And you can see me testing consistency there on the inside. And once it's somewhere I like, I apply it around the edges of the mud 
so that it looks like the dried out bits of mud that have been stuck there. I also make sure to get the recesses of the tracks. And here's the final product. I think overall it looks really good. I'm really satisfied with a lot of these new techniques that I tried. I think I've made some pretty big improvements. There's some learning lessons, things to take away. Um, but overall, I'm looking forward to continuing this hobby and making episode two of The Learning Curve.